a modern-day patriot pastor in his own right. Paul is the pastor of Fairview Baptist Church in Edmond, Oklahoma. He's the founder and president of Reclaiming America for Christ, a board member for numerous conservative Christian organizations, and a national conference speaker. He's an authority on America's Christian heritage and the principles of liberty passed down to us by our patriot ancestors. Paul is also an outspoken opponent of the tyranny threatening to steal those liberties away. Presenting to you the biblical principles of government, please join us in welcoming Pastor Paul Blair. Good evening. Good evening. It's good to see you. Thank you for being here at our eighth annual Reclaiming America for Christ conference. It's hard to believe this is already number eight. Thank you for those of you that have been with us all along. You are in for the best year yet. You know, we have been taught as Christians that we are supposed to compartmentalize our Christianity. You know, a picture, if you will, a plate at a Sunday school picnic divided into little partitions where you've got the coleslaw over here and the potato slab over here and, and the baked beans over here. Well, we have been taught by obviously the unsaved left that that is how we are supposed to function as Christians. We're supposed to have our Christianity over in this little corner from nine o'clock to noon on Sunday mornings, but don't dare take the Christianity with you when you go to uh, work during the course of the week, or don't you dare let Christianity influence the way you parent your kids or, or anything else. Folks, where in the world did that come, my idea come from? John 20, 28, one of my favorite, most precious verses of scripture, where, of course, Thomas had doubted the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and a week after he had said, I'll not believe unless I can put my fingers in the nail prints in his hands. Well, lo and behold, there he was in the upper room. And who showed up? The resurrected Lord Jesus Christ. Thomas didn't even need to stop and put his hands, his fingers in, in the nail prints. He fell to his knees and said, my Lord and my God. Now, ladies and gentlemen, do you think that Thomas's next statement was, my Lord and my God every Sunday from nine to noon? No. Do you think it was, okay, I'll give you all of Sunday? No. When Jesus becomes the Lord of your life, he is the Lord of every facet of your life. There is no part of your life that Jesus is not supposed to be number one on. So when you go to the grocery store, Jesus is the Lord of your life. When you go on vacation, Jesus is the Lord of your life. When you are at the office as an employer, you should function differently. Why? Because Jesus is your Lord. When you are at the office as an employee, you should function differently because Jesus is the Lord. Is it possible to get that centered at all, gentlemen? Because Jesus is the Lord. I'm sorry, we obviously are having some technical difficulties. I'm going to do a soft shoe in just a moment. <laughs> but the reality is when Jesus becomes your Lord, he is the Lord of everything. There is not a single area of your life that he is not in charge of. So should that include how you function as an employee, employer, a husband, a wife, a parent, a child? Yep. And it also should make a difference on how you look in the world of politics as well, should it not? The title of my talk is The Biblical Principles of American Civil Government. This gentleman, John Witherspoon, is one of the most influential men of our founding era. Under his leadership, he literally helped shape the worldview of most of those that we refer to as our founding fathers. Reverend Witherspoon trained as the president of Princeton University, 39 future congressmen, 21 future senators, 12 future governors, three future Supreme Court justices, one future vice president, and one future president, all trained in a biblical worldview by the Reverend John Witherspoon, who himself was a signer of the Declaration of Independence and a member of the Continental Congress. Reverend Witherspoon said this, there is not a single instance in history in which civil liberty was lost and religious liberty preserved entire. Now, ladies and gentlemen, you might ask, why in the world was a preacher talking about such things as civil liberty? Well, ladies and gentlemen, understand that the cultural issue of their day was not abortion. That was unheard of. 
The cultural issue of their day was not homosexual marriage, that was unfathomable. The issue of their day was civil and religious liberty. The ability to live your life as a Christian without the fear of being persecuted or prosecuted by the government. We know this to be true historically. Think about Christian history. We see the birth of the church in Acts chapter two and by Acts chapter four, we see persecution. The church was first persecuted by the Sanhedrin, then by pagan Rome, then by the Holy Roman Empire through the dark ages down throughout history and even around the world today. In communist nations and in Muslim nations, we still have Christians persecuted because of their faith. Only in America and only for the last 200 years have we been able to enjoy both civil and religious liberty. Folks, we are not the rule. We are the exception to the rule. So why is America different? Well, first of all, you must understand this. If I was a dictator and I wanted to establish a totalitarian control over this room, if I wanted to control your body, I would first have to control the way you think. So in order to establish a totalitarian government, I must nationalize education so I can control what you're being taught. I must control the flow of information through the media so I can control what you think. I also have to control your conscience because whatever I say has to be obeyed without question and there can be no higher appeal than the government. So, you either have an atheistic communism as they had in Red China or the former Soviet Union where there is no God, so by default government becomes God. Government determines what's right and wrong. Government determines what the truth is. Government grants rights and government takes rights away. Or you have a theocracy as they have in Iran or Saudi Arabia where government and God are one and the same. And again, you come to the same end. Government determines what truth is. Government establishes what right and wrong is. Government grants rights and government takes rights away. And there's no higher appeal than the government. Folks, that's exactly what Nimrod sought to establish in ancient Babel. That's what Nebuchadnezzar had successfully established in ancient Babylon. And that's what King James had established in old England. So he was the head of the church and he was also the head of the state. If you disagreed with the king, not only was it an act of heresy, but it was an act of treason. You could be arrested, you could be persecuted, you could even be put to death. It was for this cause that this group literally risked their lives to come to the new world. You'll notice in this painting, this isn't a group of pros prospectors, this isn't a bunch of gold digging men. These are families that were boarding the Speedwell and the Mayflower to come to the new world. Why? Because they desired to be able to enjoy both civil and religious liberty. Now, these grow groups and the ones that followed them, the great Puritan and the, uh, the great Puritan migration, these had devout biblical worldviews. And they understood that it was God that established the home. So when they sought direction on the decisions they should make concerning their own homes, they went to the pages of Scripture. They understood that it was God that established the church. So as they were breaking away from the Anglican church, well, where would they go for instruction on their function in the church? Well, they went to the pages of Scripture. And they also understood, Genesis 9, 6, that it was God that came up with the idea of civil government. So if they wanted instruction on how they should organize their civil government, they also went to the pages of Scripture. As a matter of fact, the historian John Pelfrey said in 1859 that the Puritans searched the Bible for principles that could be incorporated into civil law, things that we now take for granted. Would it surprise you to learn that preachers were at one time political experts? Let me explain. Politics does not mean Republican and Democrat. That's a game that the Karl Roves of the world have us playing today. Politics, by definition, means the art or science of governing. And if the idea of civil government was God's idea, then he would have a lot to share with how it should be done properly. And if pastors truly are perusing their Bibles, searching the pages of Scripture for truth, then you would logically conclude that they would be experts on what God's will is for civil government. As a matter of fact, Alice Baldwin in her great work, The New England Clergy and the American Revolution, said that these election sermons that the pastors would preach were reproduced and spread throughout the colonies where they became textbooks on politics. Hey, our forefathers in those days learned politics from their pastors. These things that we take for granted, ladies and gentlemen, are in fact unique to the United States of America. The fundamental principle that all men are created equal did not come out of the Hindu caste system. That did not come out of Islam. That did not even come out of old England where you had the nobility and the commoners. 
That was a result of the great awakening. All people are equal at the foot of the cross. The concept of natural law, a biblical principle. The monogamous family unit comes from the Bible. Our laws of morality that we've enjoyed for over 200 years come from the Bible. Ownership and the rights of private property. That didn't even come from old England. It was the king's forest, the king's dale, the king's navy. You were the king's subject. The idea that we, everyday citizens, can have our own castle and own our own property and buy and sell, a biblical principle, a right to a fair trial from the Bible, no conviction without two or three witnesses from the Bible, a punishment that fits the crime, i.e. eye for eye, tooth for tooth from the Bible, the Republican form of government. You say, Pastor, prove to me that that came out of the Bible. Okay, I will. When Moses was leading the Israelites across the wilderness, he was doing them and himself a disservice as he was attempting to rightly judge between them on a daily basis. But there was one of him and a couple of men of them. His father-in-law paid him a visit and said, Moses, what you're doing is not a good thing. Here's what you choo- should do. Choose that from among you capable men that fear God, love truth, and hate covetousness, and make them rulers over tens, fifties, hundreds, and thousands, and teach them to rule according to the law. Ladies and gentlemen, the birth of the Republican form of government. The idea of having a written, established, defined rule of law, defining the government and limiting its responsibilities also. The Torah, the Constitution of Israel, came from the pages of Holy Scripture. America was at one time an exceptional country. Why? Because at least our original 13 were established on a firm biblical worldview. There are three things I want to point out that they took for granted that we don't understand that really will clarify all the confusion that we face today. First of all, principle number one, they believed that the purpose of government was not to tyrannize mankind. The purpose of government was for the good of mankind. Well, where'd they get an idea like that? Straight from the Bible. Every passage of scripture, where you look in the, whether you look in Genesis, Timothy, Peter, or here in this famous passage in Romans 13 defines it. First of all, Romans 13 says that it was God's idea. God's a God of order. God designed and ordered the family. God designed and ordered the church. God designed, came up with the idea of civil government. Well, for what purpose did he come up with it? To punish the evil and to protect and reward the good. So what is the purpose of civil government? According to the pages of Holy Scripture, the purpose of civil government clearly is to punish the evil and protect the good that we may live peaceably in all godliness. Government is not to tyrannize. Government is supposed to be for the good of mankind. Point number two that they understood. There is a standard of absolute truth. There is right and wrong. Man is subject to natural law. Mr. Jefferson says in the opening words of the Declaration of Independence, he says, when in the course of human events it becomes necessary for a man, to, for a people to dissolve the political bands that have joined them to another and to assume among the powers of the earth a separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and nature's God entitle them. Wow, Mr. Jefferson, that's pretty impressive. You're basically saying that the entire justification for the 13 colonies to secede from the tyrannical rule of King George was that it was an unalienable right given you by this laws of nature and nature's God. Well, it's probably pretty important that we understand what the laws of nature and nature's God is, don't you think? Folks, it's not some poetic prose from an 18th century author. Every term in the Declaration of Independence was defined, legal terms, in Blackstone's commentaries on law. Sir William Blackstone was an 18th century English jurist. He was an expert on the law. He wrote a four-volume set of commentaries that became the cornerstone of American political thinking. He defines natural law as this. Man, considered as a creature, must necessarily be subject to the laws of his creator, for he is entirely a dependent being. And consequently, as man depends absolutely upon his maker for everything, it is necessary that he should in all points conform to his maker's will. This will of his maker is called the law of nature. And the doctrine thus delivered we call the revealed or divine law they are to be found only in the holy scriptures and no human law should be suffered to contradict these so natural law included such things as are observable we observe the law of gravity such things as are observable such as the right to defend your home and property go out and try to take a grizzly bear cub away from a grizzly bear mama and you'll learn all about the natural right to protect your home and property and the details are given to us in the pages of Holy Scripture. And they were smart enough to understand that when God had established something, we shouldn't try to overrule him. Look at the quotes of our founders. James Wilson, one of the original Supreme Court members, said if it, if it contradicts God's law, we can't go there. Alexander Hamilton, no human laws are of any validity of contrary to this. So they believed this, that man was free to legislate if God had not spoken on the issue. Example. What should the speed limit be on Interstate 35? 
200 miles an hour. No, it's not listed in the Bible. Genesis 1, Revelation 22, you'll not find it anywhere. Therefore, we are free to determine a safe and efficient speed for the speed limit on Interstate 35. However, let me ask you, what is the definition of marriage? One man, one woman, and when God has spoken, we don't have the authority and shouldn't have the audacity to try to overrule what he has said. So principle number two, there is absolute truth. It's not arbitrary. There is right and wrong. There is a foundation upon which America was built. The laws of nature. Nature's got a biblical worldview. You're going to hear a lot about that this weekend. Critical. Rights come from God. No one has a right to do wrong. Point number three, perhaps the most important. A written constitution defining the rule of law for everyone. Now pay very close attention to this. You say, Pastor, where'd you get that out of the Bible? Well, how about right here? Long before the Israelites were ever going to ask for a king, God gave, gave Moses instruction for what they would do when they did. And he said, before you ask for a king or before that king takes his seat on the throne, he is supposed to take a copy of the law, the Torah, the constitution for Israel. And he's supposed to write it out longhand so he knows every jot and every tittle of it. And then that king is not free to do whatever he wants to do. In fact, it says clearly he can't deviate to his left or to his right. He must govern according to the rule of law, a written constitution defining and limiting this civil political body. Now, let me go a little deeper here. They believe that if man lived in a state of nature, there would be no need to have any kind of civil government. Let me explain. If I lived on a deserted island and I was all by myself, I'm the only one on that island, I would have no need to pass a curfew violation, would I? I can go to bed whenever I wanted to. It's not going to bother anybody. I would have no need to put up a stoplight, would I? There's no cross traffic. I'm it. Therefore, if I lived on an island all by myself in a state of nature, I would have no need for civil law. However, would I still be subject to the laws of gravity? Yeah. Would I still be subject to God's laws of morality? Absolutely. So man living in a state of nature would have no need of civil law, but would still be subject to natural law. But man is incapable of living by himself. We're social creatures. So we choose to have taken what God has given to us, unalienable rights, then we the people delegate certain limited responsibility to this civil body politic created by us, answerable to us, of, by, and for us, recallable by us, we limit the power and we delegate what they can and cannot do. Look at some of the writings of our earliest forefathers. John Davenport, a pastor in Boston, in his discourse on civil government, he says the power of the government originates in the people. That they may measure out so much power that they may give it out conditionally. So as if the condition be violated, they may resume their power of choosing another. They can choose another governor. They can choose another government. That's what it says in the declaration that we maintain the ability to alter, abolish, or throw off if the government becomes tyrannical. But folks, what I want you to understand is the power doesn't lie in they, the government. The power rests in we, the people. Look at what Thomas Hooker had to say. Pastor Thomas Hooker, the founder of Connecticut, said this in a letter to John Winthrop, 1638, the foundation of authority is laid firstly in the free consent of the people. Where does the power lie? They the government? No, we the people. Look at what Roger Williams, I'm sorry, Pastor Roger Williams, the founder of Rhode Island, had to say. He said, the sovereign, original, and foundation of civil power lies in the people. And it is evident that such governments as are by them erected and established have no more power uh, nor for no longer time that the civil power or people consenting and agreeing shall be trust with them. Where does all the power lie? We the people. It was with these three basic truths that this group met in Philadelphia in 1787. Now, by the way, this was not a kumbaya, let's all hold hands and sing moment. This was fierce political squabbling. There were large states, small states, slave states, free states. There's question as whether they had the justification to throw out the Articles of Confederation, which was our existing constitution to begin with. There was all sorts of stuff going on here. But one of the biggest arguments was between two political parties. <laughs> Imagine that. 
the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists. The Federalists wanted to create a stronger, as they called it, central government. The Anti-Federalists, men like Patrick Henry, said, wait a second. By the way, he was not at this meeting because he thought it was a sham. He didn't even go. But the Anti-Federalists said, wait a second. We don't want to give too much power there. We just fought four years ago to free ourselves from a tyranny. Do we really want to run the risk of creating another tyranny? But they were assured there was nothing to worry about. That can't happen. Well, why, pray tell, can't it happen? Because we've written it all down in the Constitution, and we have defined the powers of the new central government. As a matter of fact, in Federalist 45, it says this, the powers delegated by the proposed Constitution to the federal government are few and defined. How many of you think that they think that their power is still few and defined? Those which are to remain in the state governments are numerous and indefinite. The former will be exercised principally on external objects as war, peace, negotiation, and foreign commerce. The powers reserved to the several states will extend to all objects which in the ordinary course of affairs concern the lives, liberties, and properties of the people and the internal order, improvement, and prosperity of the state. So everything that took place around the border, including negotiating with other countries, was the responsibility of this new central government. Everything that took place inside the, the boundaries, especially everything that took place within each sovereign states, was not the federal government's business. They don't have the constitutional authority to go there. But what happens if they do? Oh, I know, I was taught in school. That's where the Supreme Court steps in. Folks, that's nonsense. That's nowhere in the Constitution. Federalist 33 tells us what the response is supposed to be. Who is to judge of the necessity and propriety of the laws to be passed for executing the powers of the Union? If the federal government should overpass the just bounds of its authority and make a tyrannical use of its powers, the people whose creature it is must appeal to the standard they have formed and take such measure to redress the injury done to the Constitution. Remember natural law. That who is created is subject to the creator. Ladies and gentlemen, Washington did not create the states. The states created this central government, designed it, the three branches, and then limited what things they could and could not do. And then we didn't leave it up to a branch of the federal government to determine whether the federal government was breaking the law. Does that make any sense to you? Imagine if I was in a disagreement with my friend Dan Fisher and I asked my mom to come and decide between us. You know what? I think she's going to be a little bit partial towards me. Now understand quickly as I wrap up here what our founding generation was facing. That was the principal deal. There were charters signed between the colonies individually and the King of England. And the King simply decided that he was not going to obey the charters. He was going to do whatever he wanted to do. Hey, I'm the king. The law doesn't apply to me. Does that sound familiar? Yes. By the way, don't refer to them as revolutionaries. Our founding fathers were fighting to restore the sovereign government. It was the king of England that was breaking the law. It was he that had rebelled against the rule of law. Well, you know what? We would still be subjects of this tyranny if it wasn't for this group, the sons of Issachar of their generation, the church of the 18th century led by these patriot pastors whom history calls, actually the English called the black-robed regiment because every Sunday morning they would ascend to their, ro to their pulpits in their black clerical robes and stir the people's hearts toward liberty. Look at a message this, this one, Reverend John Mayhew preached in uh, West Church in Boston, 1749, on this very issue. He said, the king in his coronation oath swears to exercise only such a power as the Constitution gives him. Does that make sense? Yep. And the citizen in the oath of allegiance swears only to obey in the exercise of such powers. The king is as much bound by his oath not to infringe the legal rights of the people as the people are bound to yield subjection to him. From whence it follows that as soon as the king sets himself up above the law, he loses the king and the tyrant, and he does to all intents and purposes unking himself by acting out of and beyond that sphere which the Constitution allows him to move in. And in such cases, he has no more right to be obeyed than any inferior officer who has acted beyond his commission. 
Wow. Brother Paul, are you saying that you're supposed to, that Pastor Mayhew was telling them to break the law? No. If the king created a law that he didn't have the authority to create, then it wasn't a law at all and need not be adhered to. By the way, if Washington does something like creating a national health care system, they don't have the authority to do that according to the Constitution. And the responsibility to stand against and restore the rule of law falls on we the people of the sovereign states. And a state like Oklahoma, go ahead. You might say, well, Brother Paul, what about Romans 13? What about Romans 13? We already covered that. First of all, we don't have a king. In America, where does all the power lie? We the people. Plus, what's the purpose of government? The good of mankind and not to tyrannize. So what happens when a government becomes perverse, flips over and begins punishing the good and rewarding the evil? Well, I don't know. what they do in the Bible? What the Hebrew midwives do when they were commanded by the Pharaoh to murder the Israeli male babies? They disobeyed the law because it was an ungodly, unjust law. What did uh, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego do when Nebuchadnezzar said, hey, you're going to get down on your knees and you're going to worship this golden image whenever you hear the band play? They disobeyed the law. Well, weren't they defying God? No, I think I know which side God was on that one. As a matter of fact, the Son of God was in the fiery furnace with them, brought them through. What about Daniel? When they passed the law that you couldn't pray to anybody except the king of, of Media Persia. Daniel went straight to his room, opened the windows, got down on his knees, and prayed to yad heh vav -Hey. Guess what? He defied an ungodly, unjust civil law. Which side was God on that one? His. The angel of the Lord was in the lion's den with him all night. And by the way, one of the proposed ideas for the first great seal of the United States proposed by Sam Adams, uh, excuse me, by John Adams, uh, John, uh, um, um, oh, who was it? Uh, oh, I can picture Jefferson, Adams, and uh, oh, who's the old guy? He's like 80. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's me. Franklin. <laughs> Two of the supposedly least religious of our founding fathers, their idea for the, for the United States seal was a depiction of the Exodus story. Right in the middle of the seal, you've got the Egyptians drowning in the Red Sea. You've got the Isra Israelites on the, on the shore. You've got a pillar of a fire and a pillar of a cloud in the background. And around the perimeter of the, of the seal, it says resistance to tyranny is obedience to God. Whose side was God on? Go ahead. Whose side was God on in the Exodus when Moses defied the civil government? Whose side was God on in our war for independence? Well, I happen to think he was on ours. Folks, tonight you are going to learn a lot. You're going to learn some tremendous education on biblical worldview. You're going to learn some tremendous stuff on apologetics tonight and tomorrow. This will be literally a life-changing weekend. But our third speaker tonight is an American historian and constitutionalist. I'm a student of history. This guy's an expert. He writes the books that I read. And at the end of the evening, we are going to have an opportunity to take action. Understand that the states have the ability to say no when Washington acts illegally. Again, our third speaker is going to teach you in depth about this topic. Then I will close with a plan to stop abortion and save natural marriage in the state of Oklahoma. God bless you. You've been a wonderful audience.